Live from Las Vegas, it's Halloween. Welcome to Trials with a Z. I'd like to start by introducing our very special guests on our celebrity panel today. Uh, first, we have Brad Hightower. Now, Brad, let me, let me read your uh, uh, credentials here. You are the CEO of Hightower Clinical. Uh, you've worked in the clinical space for over 10 years, and you can be heard on your podcast, Note to File. Note to File. Uh, interesting. You got very, it. Very you good. Got it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brad. Welcome. Welcome to uh, the special Halloween edition of Trials with a Z. Uh, next, we have Nico. Uh, Nico O'Kingsons. Nico is Yuma's Vice President of Commercial Decentralized Trials. See a theme? See a theme cooking up here on uh, a special brew in the cauldron on Halloween. Uh, he's worked with the industry in the industry since 2007, holding positions with Cardinal Health, Net Health, and Tissue Analytics. Welcome, welcome to the show, Nico. Thank you, thank you. We may have a special guest. We may have a special guest joining in a, in a little while. Uh, but last but not least, I want to uh, introduce my, uh, my 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 world famous co-host, uh, 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 Amanda McLean, a Trials co-host. Uh, welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Well, let's just let's just kick it kick it right off. Uh, uh, before the show, there was a little banter here uh, backstage, and uh, Aniko mentioned he had read uh, a post a posting on LinkedIn uh, by Brad about some of these uh, let's say, uh, corporate acquisitions that we're seeing out there. A lot of folks want to get a piece of the clinical trials pie, it seems. Uh, and uh, and uh, Brad, I think I think you may have a couple. A couple of thoughts on that. We we start off with uh, with uh, hearing your thoughts on these um, on this this interest this interest in uh, uh, Amazon, Apple, Wal Wal Walgreens, CVS. Everybody seems to seems to be wanting to take a, a delicious slice of that clinical research pumpkin pie on Halloween. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a really interesting time right now. A lot of uh, you know a lot of retailers sort of jumping in the pile, uh, trying to get involved in clinical research and. You know, the post I made this morning was kind of a, a response to another conversation I had where, you know, someone from a retail pharmacy was trying to tell me, well, these are trusted, we are trusted brands. And that's why, uh, you know, we'll succeed when it comes to you know, clinical trial work. And, uh, you know, if you Google, just Google some retail pharmacies and look at some of the uh, lawsuits they're dealing with in terms of, you know, potentially misleading patients by placing, you know, homeopathic drugs or homeopathic products besides beside actual drugs and then uh being sued for their role in the opioid epidemic and you know to me that's that's not exactly what you know i want when i'm uh trying to be a part of a clinical trial so to me I, you know i just have a healthy amount of um skepticism with some of these these retailers coming to market so I don't know. That's just just me. I'm really curious. I'm curious to hear what you guys think. But it's uh, something that, you know, having done this at the site level for so long, kind of sticks out uh, in my in my mind. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Uh, now you mentioned uh, uh, homeopathy. I'm not an expert in homeopathy, but I understand one of the basic principles is the lower the uh, amount of the molecule or whatever, the more powerful the homeopathic remedy is. But there is, you, you do share that philosophy maybe in the sense that less is more with some of this remote and decentralized trial. So we'll get to that in a moment, but let's hear Nico. Nico, what do you think about this, this, uh, cor this corporate interest, I'll call it, uh, uh, in, uh, in clinical research that, that seems to have, have kind of really, uh, really just uh, rained down upon us uh, uh, recently? You know, as, as I brought it up uh, when we started the, the banter, uh, I mentioned the word controversial. And obviously, uh, yes. I, I reach for my popcorn and I, I sit back and I, I tend to absorb the, the, the voices that appear uh, in, in, the, in the Brad atmosphere that he has created in LinkedIn, which is, is quite a scene. I, I, I'm a big fan. I love to see and read and, you know, very, very maybe become more active uh, with my comments. But um, my take there is, I mean, we're talking about larger corporations that have, you know, a significant stake at the delivery of drugs, you know, number one, you know, that brings a lot of, uh, you know, issues that we have confronted in the past, you know, the, the opioid pandemic, uh, just to name a few. Um, 
So, I mean, obviously it's, uh, it's interesting to see how they're, they're coming to the opportunity to be a part of, you know, the clinical trial ecosystem. Um, but I think it's fair to assess the, the previous mishaps that these corporations had experienced when it comes to their direct engagement with populations. So I think that's, it's a fair topic to discuss. Uh, and I welcome this skepticism and, and really bringing that pragmatic view that it's not just a hot topic to jump into trials. It's also more of a community type of relationship that these retailers have in the nation. I mean, they, most of them reach, you know, probably in aggregate, they reach every person that lives in the States. So it's something worth discussing. Right. Interesting. That's an interesting perspective, because when you first talked about their stake, I thought, well, well, maybe we can kind of bucket them into the folks that have a serious stake, your, your CVS, your Walgreens, even your Walmart, and then the folks that um, that uh, are, are, are getting into it from a fresh perspective, Apple, and I was going to say Amazon, but no, Amazon, Amazon uh, got their feet wet in the, in the, in the pharmacy game, too. So, so you're right. It's, it's an over our octopus with his tentacles uh, going around. I, sh I should have thought of more of a monstrous uh, uh, metaphor on Halloween. But that, oh, wow, so awesome. Gita has just joined. Uh, Dr. G is in the house. Dr. G is in the house. So we were just, uh, let, let me catch up the audience here. Welcome, Dr. Gita Nayar. Gita is the chief medical officer at Salesforce, uh, serves on multiple boards. Uh, she's also an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Florida International University. And uh, the trials fans may recognize her uh, from when she was a special guest on episode five of Trials with a Z. Welcome, Dr. G. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so disappointed. None of you brought your Halloween costume. <laughs> Oh, oh, well, oh, I, look at that. <laughs> I do have a special surprise, though. Check, uh, uh, check this out. Check this oh, out, Dr. G. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, let me get it. Let me get it there. Wow, well, there we go. <laughs> okay, one more. One, one, one more. There we are. There we go. There we go. <laughs> all right, all right. Dr. G is bringing it. Dr. G is bringing it. So we were just talking. This is interesting. This is interesting because we we said this before Dr. G entered. Of course, Dr. G works for Salesforce. That's a big. That's a big company. Uh, 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 Brad mentioned how a lot of big companies are jumping in, jumping in not to not only the healthcare space but specifically to the clinical trial space. And uh, uh, Brad Brad kind of introduced the topic. Uh, and Nico had some concerns about. Uh, some of the, the footprint that these folks already have, right? If it's a Walgreens or CVS or, 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 or something of that nature. And, and, I, and I started thinking, yeah, that, you know, even, even an Amazon, you know, is getting their feet wet. What do you think from the perspective of, of um, your, your experience as a physician and now, and now at, 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 at Salesforce, how do you feel about these folks such as uh, 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 Walgreens and CVS and, and other folks getting interested in the clinical trial space? Well, first of all, I think it's desperately needed. Okay, now you guys are shaming me. I'm going to take this off because you guys are all clearly like- No, 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 I'm part of the scene. I feel like I can't it. answer this question seriously. <laughs> 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 um, but look, the, the truth is there's a lot of space. Um, there's a lot of space for opportunity in the clinical trial space, in, in the healthcare space in general, right? There are so many different fractured uh, parts of the system, one of them being clinical trial, trials, right? On the clinical side, here we are prescribing the same treatment for everyone, even though all the studies have been done only on people that look like Scott, right? When the patient in front of me is an African-American female or someone that looks like me. So I think that the need is certainly there if we're ever going to drive to actually personalized diagnostics and therapeutics. And as far as the method by which we do clinical trial enrollment, I mean, we have so many patient-facing technologies, so many consumer-facing technologies, so many AI technologies where we can get much smarter about either how to enroll someone, let them know they're eligible, and then actually get them through the door. So I think the sky's the limit, and anyone who can do it, it's a, it's a fair and open marketplace. They absolutely should be entering the market and, and be in it to win it. 
That's that's an interesting perspective because uh, uh, this this topic of equity in clinical trials, and it's interesting you mention it because uh, 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 you know as you, as you know we met in the studio. I'm a big guy, so so you said people that look like me, but sometimes I think even when I get a prescription, I'm getting the same dose that they're giving to somebody a hundred pounds lighter than I am, right? And so, so I take twice as much, you know. So 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 I think uh, uh, I I absolutely relate to that too. That transcends um, uh, all sorts of all sorts of different, you know, uh, 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 kind of categories that we that, that, that we that we uh, traditionally think of. We, we've got that um, just like the safety dummies in the car, right? But if you're if you're tall enough, your head hits the as it did once when I was uh, in an accident. My I had the seatbelt on, but my head hit the, the the roof of the car before before I ever would have got to the windshield. So so that's a very uh, that's a very profound uh, uh, perspective. We need more. Uh, we need more of this so that we can address uh, some of these deep issues such as equity in clinical trials. And this is a great, this is a great way to segue back to Brad. So one thing that I've, I've talked about uh, uh, I, I, on a lot of these podcasts is, is this idea of, of when, you, when you think about the different phases of trials, right? Uh, uh, let's just call them phase one, two, three, four, many different you know, angles at which to, 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 to look at that. But, but let's, and so I'm gonna oversimplify for the sake of the show. So let's call phase one uh, um, safety trials on healthy subjects. Right, just for the for the sake of the show, I know that the, you know you can uh, have uh, talk about one uh, A and one A, one A and one B and two A and two B, and go the whole way down that that rabbit hole, deep down that rabbit hole. But um, but a phase one trial on 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 a healthy uh, uh, healthy subjects versus a phase three, a global randomized clinical trial on on affected patients. Now, of course, we're all participants, but I'm going to use the the old terminology because because the old terminology is critical. For this, for this difference that I want to, I want to highlight, um, those healthy subjects are getting paid uh, uh, to test the the safety of the of the of the uh, 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 of the drug. Those uh, affected patients are also uh, hopefully uh, ostensibly benefiting from the trial, right? Especially in something like an oncology trial, but maybe in other trials too. But look at where all of those uh, uh, phase one clinics are. Right. So, so you're, 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 it, it feels as though I shouldn't say what, what's happening. Sometimes it feels as though those, those early trials from which the pay, the, the subjects don't get any benefit except maybe getting paid for their participation. Um, they're just, they're just being tested upon for safety. They're not getting any benefit of the treatment, but some of the trials where those drugs might be helpful for your condition, those may be at, at, at hospitals that, that, that folks, uh, 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 in, in, in different communities, uh, whether it's poor communities, rural communities, et cetera, may not have access to those hospitals. So that's one, that's one um, argument for, for decentralized trials. But Brad, being a trials uh, uh, a site expert, I want to hear your perspective first on, 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 on this idea. Yeah, I mean, so my big push and what, you know, shamelessly plugging what I do, but, you know, partnering with uh, community physicians, you know, and I feel like that's in combination with some of these uh, you know, DCT technologies or methodologies, whatever you want to call them. I think that's really the future. I mean, I think it is, there's a lot of, you know, community-based, um, clinical site, clinical researchers out there who, you know, they can partner with the community practices, get out of the hospitals, get out into the communities. Uh, I mean, I think that's, that's a key. And look, that's not necessarily DCT. It doesn't sound very sexy, but we can embed within a community practice at no cost and, you know, help spin up sites with, you know, very little overhead, uh, and very little in very little time. Now, of course that's, you know, it's more complicated than that, but, uh, I feel like instead of, uh, inventing a lot of new technology, like that option exists right now and could be done with, you know, much more simply than, than maybe some of these other, other methods. Interesting, interesting. So I'll, I'll, I'll go to, to Nico first, but I'll just add, uh, I, could, I could interpret that as, as a, a, an argument for, um, uh, for uh, what, I, what I interpreted from Aguita's perspective, what better place to spin up those sites than at the local Walgreens where you already have that natural, natural distri distribution to all of those communities. But, but, but let's, go to, let's go to Nico first. Uh, uh, Nico, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, on, on this, uh, just, just broaching this topic of equity and access to clinical trials. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great, great topic. And I, I kind of commend Brad for, for becoming the de facto voice of uh, the site um, and kind of really bringing that element. Um, 
we see it a little bit different than again the shameless plug for Huma, you know, who I represent and, and who I believe in, in the mission is it's not so much on seeing, you know, what's directly in front of us, but it's a long term vision of delivering technology for healthcare and to empower research. Because it starts with what means are we using to collect data, insights, without thinking about trials. That's number one. How are we engaging with patients so we keep them, you know, compliant if they're chronic? Uh, they're engaging properly with their provider. Something as simple as a text reminder for an appointment was effective for me yesterday to cancel the appointment that I couldn't make next week. And with us, our vision is to really look ahead five to 10 years where digital becomes the vehicle to empower us to be connected to sites. And again, that research, our providers, hospitals, researchers, you name it. And that creates the avenue to effectively deliver or include someone in a trial. So my take is a little bit different. It's long term. It's not what's happening here now. We're plugging the direction in a GPS where we don't know where we're going, but we don't care if it's raining, if it's hot, if the road is bumpy, we're going for it. And that's, that's the perspective that we bring. You know, we work with healthcare, we work with you know, national governments in Europe, we work with pharma clients, but it's, it's the, the most eye-opening thing is how, many, how this topic and you know, the inclusion of new tech vendors that are coming narrow focus on the DCT wave, that they're not really thinking about the long-term vision. And that's really what we're focused on. It's this long-term pathway. It's not gonna happen today, but we have to start taking the steps to get there five, 10 years you know, down the road. Got it. Got it. Interesting. So, 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 full circle back to back to 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 to, to Gita. Uh, this is an interesting interesting perspective you brought to the the the, the conversation. Uh, Nico mentioned the the future. Uh, how do you see the the, the future of trials, uh, Doctor G? Uh, what 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 um what what direction do you see all of these things sort of uh, 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 mer merging into? Well, I, a couple of things. I, I think that we're all appreciating that there needs to be more diversity in trials that reflect the patient populations that we actually treat, right? And an understanding of, of certain certain di diseases are genetically predisposed to certain populations. So it is actually okay to focus on African Americans for lupus, for example, right? So, so starting with that knowledge, we're not starting from scratch. I also think there's going to be pieces of, of virtual technology and the way that we not just engage patients, but a lot of how we do the trials. There are parts to it that can be done virtually or in the home. You know, to be compliant in a clinical trial that takes a year, two years, three years, lots of paperwork, there's a lot that goes into a trial. And some of it's not just compensated with uh, financial returns, right? It's, it's a significant com uh, commitment in time, transportation family members. So I think the convenience of clinical trials will hopefully get better or parts of them and there will be this openness to that, um, which I think will also expand the populations that we're able to include, frankly, because there'll be increased access to clinical trials. I do think we're going to see retailers and others that are more in the community, more embedded in the community, and that have found themselves now increasingly in healthcare playing a role, playing a role that we've desperately needed them to play. Um, and I do, I do think there is a place also for um, analytics and, and smart ways to do clinical trial, not just enrollment, but compliance and, and also education, to be honest. You, you mentioned, right, that there's this, this understanding that you may or may not get anything in return. Hopefully, at a minimum, we're also educating um, folks in the trial about XYZ related to whatever they might be a part of. But I, I think there is a moral... Um, a moral imperative independent of how the study is done and an opportunity to continue that conversation even after the even after the study. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the educational component, yeah, is really is really fundamental because, of course, I'm a I am a, a decentralized uh, trials maximalist myself. However, you could replicate that same that same uh, uh, problem with remote trials that you have uh, with with uh, trials on site, if you don't educate, uh, not, not only open it up to those populations, 
but 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 provide the education because let's face it, there is uh, some troubled history in in in, in, in clinical trials mm -hmm. uh, with 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 groups that were uh, 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 treated. Uh, uh, I mean, very badly would be an understatement uh, in in the past uh, 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 across the world, but but yes, also in in, in the United States, as as uh, everyone is is familiar with. So if we don't address that head on, um, you know, we, we could we could end up. Uh, continuing to to um, uh, uh, you know get get greater adoption, but not actually focus that adoption uh, 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 on the folks who are are currently um, excluded, uh, uh, and, and that's the education component is is a component that 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 needs to be incorporated. And as you mentioned, Gita, that really resonates with me. You have that community element built into some of these some of these current. Um, uh, institutions, right? Even if it's a, a corner drugstore where you know you know the people that work, right? Your neighbor works there or something. There might be more trust than than an online uh, DCT, uh, 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 you know, a sign up portal, right? So so very very interesting. Now now now, Amanda, what are you seeing? Amanda's on the front lines here at Clean Cap. I'll get I'll give a plug too. I don't do it that often on trials, but it's Clean Capture. Clean Capture is our main gig. That's our main jam. What what are you seeing uh, uh, on the ground, Amanda, in terms of interest in, in decentralized trials uh, uh, versus uh, versus traditional trials at the site versus versus hybrid trials, a mix of a mix of both approaches? Yeah, I mean, I think as as everyone has kind of said uh, at this point, we're all everyone in the industry, from my you know experience, kind of seems to uh, seems to agree that this is the direction we're heading. Decentralized trials. Um, you know, we're, we're something that has been talked about for a long time uh, during the pandemic when folks literally couldn't go into the sites. It became kind of a catalyst need where I think a lot of companies that were maybe a little resistant to it, uh, you know, figured out, oh, maybe we do need this technology and we need it quickly in case something like this happens again. I think... Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to to kind of unpack with this topic. I think again, we're all in agree. <clears throat> excuse me, agreement that it's headed this way, and there's going to be different needs for different trials. So that needs to be stated too. Of course, it depends on is this drug or medical device? Is there a surgical component? How is the therapy being delivered? But I think we're all kind of you know talking about where could the sites be? How do we educate patients? How do we, uh, you know, um, ensure that there's more equity and, and equality in clinical trials where the, the subjects and the patients are the same, you know, people? Um, and, you know, where, where can the sites be? Can it be, you know, um, done with current institutions that we have now, the more traditional sites that, you know, Brad was saying we could spin up? Could it be at the local corner store or Walgreens? Or could it be in the home? Could it be, you know, no site, a virtual site? But then we kind of have to think, you know, how do we, how do we ensure that that continued education um, is, is being provided? What's, what's the best way? So I guess, um, I didn't really answer your question, but that's kind of um, I'm taking in all of these different perspectives. But I think what I what I'm seeing on the ground is that these are the questions that everybody has. What's the what's the most efficient way to to solve these issues that we all recognize in clinical research currently? Yeah, and that's food for thought too. That takes us back. I I, I know I know you know. Uh, the, 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 the pandemic ebbs and flows in terms of its, its, uh, 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 uh the, the, the media's propensity to, 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 uh, to, to, to write those headlines. But, but we can't, we certainly can't ignore it as a, as a, as a very, uh, uh, you know, fundamental event. And I'm, I'm, I'm especially interested, um, speaking of the, of the, of the sites, Brad, what, what happened at the site level? So I'm thinking back, you know, March, uh, what was it? March, I remember, um, we were, uh, uh, Amanda and I were actually uh, in LA visiting customers the week before the pandemic was declared. And of course our appointments started getting canceled one by one. Uh, uh, I know it was Friday the 13th when we came back. So I think it was declared maybe like on uh, March 11th or something like that. And then, and then the, and then the, um, the shelter in place started the following, following Tuesdays. It's, it's etched into my, etched into my brain. What happened? Uh, what ha speaking of what happened on the ground, what happened at the sites? on March, you know, 17th, 
uh, uh, 2020. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, first of all, I think it was probably a mixed bag depending on where you are in the country, right? I live in Oklahoma, uh, so for for better or worse, uh, there really weren't uh, a lot, as many changes as you would think, especially probably as there were on the coast, especially the West Coast. Uh, for interesting, again, depending on what you think, for better or worse, a lot of clinics continue to operate, you know, essentially as normal. I mean, I do. We work with a large hospital. Uh, obviously, there were. Uh, they cut off elective procedures, which uh, means we could not enroll, you know, any of our uh, IBD patients because we couldn't do colonoscopies. So uh, you saw sponsors start to scramble to keep patients on drug by getting direct to patient shipments in place. Uh, you saw, you know, some telehealth visits uh, or options kind of start to open up very quickly on some of these trials. So. Uh, Again, a little bit of a mixed bag, but there was definitely a strong shift from the sponsors trying to support the site so that they could keep their, you know, current patients in in trials and on drug as as much as possible. Interesting, interesting. Uh, now, now uh, on the on there on the other end of the spectrum, Nico, what did you see in your business? Was was uh, uh, because uh, you know Amanda and I saw that, that as she said it really was a a catalyst for the adoption of uh of uh, uh of uh, uh dct technology what did what did you see at you so in in and that's a you know it's a great question because uh it's it's always fun to to play you know press rewind and, and put yourself in those days because you know we've never experienced something like that and and, and you kind of notice you know what was the rea your reaction our reaction ourselves but also the reaction of your clients that you know, previously saw the use of digital as a more or less of a novelty, uh, where it was always in the periphery. It became playtime. Let's play. Let's think ahead. But then, then the pandemic said, you know, it, it got dialed all the way in, and there was panic. Uh, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, panic with uh, trials that were mid-flight. That's number one. You know, you, you have a trial that is, you know, 50% of the way through, and now you have to think about how you're going to collect the data of the, your current participants, not even thinking about how are you going to continue to enroll. Um, and one of the things that I witnessed is that there was that panic throughout where, you know, you're trying to throw everything at it uh, in a fast pace, and, and you know, unfortunately, some things do stick and others don't. Uh, and I think that's the the account that we are all doing now, sites, tech providers, sponsors, PIs, where we're, we're trying to you know, really assess, you know, we're, we're, I believe we're in a fully post-pandemic environment now where things are you know, becoming you know, normalized. And, and I think everyone is trying to, to really do their, their assessment of, okay, what, what is practical and what's not practical, what is a novelty and what's something that can, can really help us deliver some of these objectives. And the objectives are many, you know, it's not just we need to push more innovation in, in digital solutions, but it's more about some of these issues that we're facing, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the inefficiencies in, in the process, you know, the bottleneck that we, we, we experience, you know, we continue to experience the, the R&D bottleneck and how can we, you know, widen the the bottle so we can have more innovation flow. Um, but again, I, it's, I always kind of go in retrospect and I see the panic. I see, you know, people taking chances because we, we all have to. Um, but now it's, it's an interesting place where, you know, we're, we're assessing, we're, we're understanding what worked, what didn't. Um, and my message sometimes is just because it, it didn't work or it wasn't implemented properly, we shouldn't just completely, bit, you know, dismiss it. We do have to assess it. We now have to plan better. We have to be intentional about how we're going to use these methods. Sometimes I call them methods because it's beyond technology. It's, it's really the processes that are, that, that are underneath everything else. I mean, you know, Brad is nodding his head. It, to run a trial, it's like 200, 300 different processes that, that sites have to do or the sponsor have to implement. And, and, and that really is the core of how you implement anything new that you're going to include in a study. Um, and again, I think we are in that, pre in, in that period where I think collectively we're all trying to assess and, and understand how can we intentionally include and how can we bring the process together, not just thinking tech, but thinking about you know, the operational pieces that 
we can dismiss. Thank you, thank you. And you you used a word, you used the word a term, and I wanna I wanna get everyone's perspective on it. And I'll, I'll start with I'll start with Dr. G uh, because after all, uh, 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 you you are a doctor, Dr. G. And from the, the perspective of of, of having a, a uh, you know, very, very well-rounded career in healthcare. But at the end of the day, uh, you're practicing, right? You're practicing medical doctor right right now. Is that correct? What do you think of this term post-pandemic? Post-pandemic. Are we post-pandemic? So, you know, we are exiting the pandemic. I like to say we're <laughs> exiting the pandemic. Uh, COVID is not over. The pandemic is not over. It has become much more manageable. And what I will say is that it really depends where you are in the world. And it also depends what your what your own health situation is, right? If you're an asthmatic, a smoker, a COPD, or, you know, you gotta take COVID just as seriously as you take the flu, frankly. These are things that uh, can kill you much easier than a young, healthy person or person with otherwise healthy lungs and heart. So the pandemic is not over, but we are certainly not in the emergency state that we were before. If you look at what's happening with RSV, if you look what's going to happen with just cold flu season this winter, it's not looking pretty. I mean, it's really not looking pretty. So I think the takeaway is that our health remains a priority. And the whole pandemic was nothing but a reminder that health is truly wealth. And we have to take our health seriously every day and even before we get sick, if we're smart. And it, it shouldn't take a pandemic to remind us that, but I, I think it has. And and companies who understand that and clinical trials focus on that are, are gonna make us that much more smarter and able to surmount these public health emergencies in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Dr. G. I like that term, post-emergency. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use that, not post-pandemic. <laughs> Post emergency, <laughs> that 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 resonates. That resonates, and um, and yeah, absolutely. As <laughs> they're, they're, you're getting back to this idea of, of equity, not just in clinical research but in healthcare. Yeah, the pan the pandemic may seem over to someone who's not in one of those high risk groups. Uh, but if you're in a, if you're if you're in one of those high risk groups for uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, more, uh, everything from more intense symptoms all the way up, uh, all the way up into and including death. Um, you know, that <laughs> post emergency doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean post pandemic. So that's, that's a very, very salient point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. G. What do you think? So it's a new topic. Uh, 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 uh what do you think, Brad? What do you think of, uh, about the term post pandemic and, uh, and, and, and furthermore, what are, what are your thoughts going forward? Yeah, I'm all, I mean, it's a good question. And again, being uh, uh, where I am in Oklahoma, it's tough to say, because again, it feels very much here like this, we're, we're done with it. Everyone's kind of over it. We've moved along. Obviously, there are still, um, you know, people who are, are more affected than others who are taking it more seriously. But yeah, I, I generally agree with that, uh, the sentiment of Dr. G there. But the thing I find interesting to go back to kind of what Nico had said is I think during the pandemic, there was this rush to like, okay, let's put some things in place really quickly to keep trials as, you know, working as, as normally as we can, as we sort of have come out of this, we're, you know, the big saying was no going back. We're not, we're not going back. Well, I mean, frankly, we, we've gone back in a large, to a large degree in terms of how, you know, clinical trials are being performed. I mean, there's really not any more direct to patient shipments. E-consent's hardly a thing in the new studies I see coming. Um, you know, we still have ePro and some things like this, but they're still sending monitors out to site as much as they can as remote monitoring. So for better or worse, I feel like there's been a little bit of a step back from uh, actual, you know, trial execution or trial operations since the pandemic, you know, is quote unquote over or we're post-emergency at this point. Um, but I think this is where potentially to Nico's point, maybe we're regrouping to decide, okay, what worked, what's going to work going forward and sort of what, you know, how much, how much can we bear in terms of trying some, some different things and taking what we learned from the pandemic at this point. And I think that's some of that's still unclear to be perfectly frank. Got it. Got it. So I'm going to guess you don't like the term new normal, uh, Brad, is that, is that, is that a fair, I, I just, is that a fair guess? I mean, look, this is probably, you know, topics for other podcasts in the future. But I think there's a lot of things that go on in clinical trials that that drive, not drive, but in fact, they hinder progress where progress could easily be made. And that's a whole different story. So I was always sort of cynical of the concept that 
we wouldn't go right back kind of to where we were. So it's not that I'm against it. It's just that I was, you know, I had a hard time sort of swallowing that, that sentiment at the time. Got it. Got it. Got it. Amanda, what do you think of the term new normal? I, <laughs> I'm neutral, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I do like the post-emergency or exiting the pandemic. I like that term. Um, and that's interesting that, uh, Brad, from your perspective, we've, you know, snapped back to normal, but then from my perspective as someone who sells uh, some of the solutions you mentioned, ePro, eConsent, um, eCOA, right, for hybrid trials, um, eConsent specifically has been um, a very, uh, almost every single uh, customer and prospective customer, you know, pharma companies, medical device, biotech, et cetera, um, almost all of them at least ask about it. It's definitely something that, because it sounded like, you know, ePro has been used for a long time. You're continuing to use that. That's kind of been the norm. Um, e-consent specifically, though, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it may not be implemented right now, but there may be a near future where, where you do see that more. But I think there's questions just about, I mean, that could be a whole podcast in, in and of itself, too, which decentralized trial technologies um you know there's there's a lot of uh, conflicting opinions about how patients should enroll how they should consent if there should be a standardized process every irb is going to be different um so you know there's there's definitely pros and cons but it's interesting uh, it's interesting that you're not seeing that very much but from my perspective i see it i see it a lot i don't know if yeah, Nico, think, you, you know. uh you have kind of the same opinion but um or if you're seeing you know uh folks talking about e-consent or considering e-consent or implementing it for for trials what, what yeah thank, thank, thank you amanda uh, uh uh yeah i'm curious as well nico what, what what are you seeing are you still seeing a continued interest in e-consent and and my second to last question for everyone will be well, where, do you see, where do you see the future is it is it remote is it is it in the clinic or is it or is it somewhere in between? Is it a hybrid? Is it a hybrid approach? Nico, I'll I'll, I'll start with you. So I'll, I'll take it from the the top. So the the, the topic of e consent is um, you know again another process that historically has been built in in trust. So w when you think about reading a document that it's going to speak about potential side effects and the experience of onboarding in a trial no matter how benign the investigational product might be, it can raise concerns to certain populations and, you know, the layman, you know, any, anyone can, can be concerned about reading these paragraphs. Um, and, and that's something that we can diminish. And, and I think that the human touch of someone in a site sitting down next to a participant and, and really building that bond it's something that you can really replace with technology. So that's a big challenge. That's, some, that's something that we, we really have to address. We can't just patch and say, oh, we're gonna create these awesome videos and it's gonna have this awesome audio in the background, um, Sarah McLaughlin, you know, and we're gonna be able to make it nice and cushiony. You still have to think about there's someone who's truly concerned and has questions. And so I, I think the, 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 the means of options is something that I, I think we we want to introduce. It's and it's always not the, 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 the problem of this or that. To me is this and that. Let's offer that option for someone who wants to do it that way. I don't have the time to go to the facility. Uh, I would love for you to send me an email and for me to read something and then just sign it. But there's gonna be people who I actually want to go sit down with you or maybe the site perceives that that person is much more you can be much more effective in rolling them by bringing them in so that's my and again it's a, it could be a whole a whole other uh topic of discussion but um you know where we see the future uh i am you know i think the future is bright for all of us i mean i'm 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 a, an eternal positive positive person here specifically in in this realm that we are so it's good to bring the the skepticism and, and really question but I always come back to the, the positivity that we, we live in a remarkable time where we are afforded all of this technology and solutions and the ability for us to communicate um, like this. It's, it's incredible. And we have to continue 
and half open discussions. We have to try new methods. Um, otherwise, we won't be able to evolve. We can't wait for change to get to us. We have to really you know, be forthcoming with change. And that means we have to try new things. We have to plan. We have to ponder if things are going to work. Um, yeah, and, and again, back to where we are, you know, where, where I am with Huma is, it's also that long-term vision, that macro vision, that not too short-sighted on the micro, it's the macro of engaging with patients in healthcare. Pharma wants to launch companion solutions. That's another topic that you should, you should ponder to is they want to release a drug, they want to have an app next to the drug. Well, how are you going to include all of that in, in the R&D side? And, and that's something that should be considered, should be seen as a macro. And, and that's where we are, and that's where we come into the picture. Um, but again, very positive. I think the future is bright for all of us. Uh, it's good, you know, when I heard Amanda that, you know, a lot of clients want to have this conversation. That's phenomenal, and that's what we hear as well. Uh, I think we're in that learning process. Um, and it's, again, it's a great time to, to be at. Thank you, thank you, Nico. Uh, Dr. G, what do you think? What what does the future hold for for clinical trials and 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 healthcare healthcare more broadly? So you know, I always say the future is clicks and bricks, right? So you still got to have that brick and mortar for the things that got to be done: surgeries, babies, physical exams. But certainly, the clicks for all the things uh, surrounding that that can be done. I also think we're going to see more trials done on digital tech. Right, the the good, the bad, the ugly. How do you do it in a more equitable way? Studying technology and health is is like a whole new area that we have to start focusing on because so much of what we say is well, we've never done that, we've not tested that, we've not tried that. Well, we're way beyond that at this point. And when we think about wearables, remote mon patient monitoring devices, it's high time that we start doing these studies and really know what we know and what we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I remember speaking at DIA on wearables. That was back in 2017, five five years ago. So yeah, it's time to it's time to it's time to get them uh, on the wrist. Time to get them on the wrist and uh, and, and elsewhere. So so Brad, thank you, thank you, Dr. G. Brad, we'll 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 we'll, we'll, we'll fi you'll finish that question with you. Where do you see the future direction of uh, of clinical research? Yeah, I mean, I think the future is hybrid. I mean, I, I do think it's a combination of, um, you know, continued uh, community partnerships with layering of, of these new technologies. I think with the the combination of the two uh, and then some optionality and again, different different mixes of the two. Uh, I mean, I think that's where we can have some success. To Nico's point and something I love that he kind of kind of said is that you know, I think the technologies that win are not the ones that try to replace the human element, but try to support it and and complement it, right? Because, you know, I still see patients every day as a and getting them into trials, and I know that a lot of times, like we are, we become their advocate. You know, we become uh, we build relationships with them, and I don't know that you want to, you know, outsource that out to technology entirely, but it can be much more efficiently accomplished with the good technology that we are not implementing now. So I think, again, it's, it's going to be a combination and it's going to be, it's going to be hybrid. Very well said. Very well said. Well, well, thank you to all of our, all of our guests on this special Halloween edition. Again, Brad Hightower, CEO of Hightower Clinical. Uh, check out Brad's uh, uh, podcast, Note to File, Note to File. Uh, we have uh, Nico uh, O'Kington's uh, he's uh, Yuma's Vice President of Commercial uh, and Decentralized Clinical Trials. And last but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, again on the show, I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. G. Uh, uh, Dr. G, I, I could go on with the list. She's Chief Medical Officer at Salesforce, uh, practicing, uh, practicing physician, uh, clinical professor of medicine at Florida International University. And, and I mentioned I had one more question. My final question is for you, doctor. How do you spell trials? <laughs> well, look at your wrist, Scott. T -R <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> T R I L Z. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Happy Halloween, Jacob. Roll, roll the clip. We're rolling. Okay. Okay. I'll do. I'll do another intro. So it does the song. Oh, no, 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 no. Trials with the Z. Trials spelled with a Z. Trials with Scott Wiley.
here we are in draft week in Las Vegas. What what can you remember? What what stands out to you about that that special time for you? Oh, well, I remember drafting. everything. <laughs> it changed my life. I mean, think about it. It's like it's like winning the lottery, really. It's like very much an episode from Scrubs, right? And I was like, oh my god, someone changed my dad. I must be in trouble. Like they're calling Dr. Day. I'm like, my dad is here. Then I'm like, wait a second, they're talking about me. <laughs> oh, 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 I get it. I get it. Wow. I swear we were almost kidnapped by by an Uber driver. If we weren't both backing each other up right. on every detail, it would almost be unbelievable. You know, we watched our previous shows and like some of the, the riffing going back and forth. So I have to ask, um, are you just riff, riffing with conversation or do you, do you play an instrument? A lot of folks say, you know, with the guitar, talk about you know, the, the riffs, right? John Elway, right? Uh, Warren Moon. I was wondering if you would oblige me if you would catch one from Scott Widely. Oh, really? absolutely. All right, all right, there yeah, we go. Yeah, all right. Oh, how, how did I stack up? Uh, there was no spiral. Oh, ouch, ouch, There was no ouch, spiral. Ouch. There was no spin oh, to it, but oh. uh, it was okay. All right, fair enough. Giles with Scott Widely. Giles.